Nothing annoys me more than Captain Marvel in Endgame. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today we are looking back at the games from Thursday. We are previewing a relatively small six game Friday slate as well. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. All right, let's get to it indeed. The first game of the day was an absolute ass kicking. The Detroit Pistons beat the Wizards 132-102. The Wizards, of course, significantly undermanned. So that we therefore we got some weird and wonderful type lines again. They were without Davis Bertans, the tank Tom Bryant, Flaming Mo Wagner, Rui Hachimura, and Isaiah Thomas, who was suspended. And then Bradley Beal had to go to the locker room with what the Wizards are calling lower leg soreness, which is always a worry when he's limping around. He's had issues with stress reactions and stress fractures in that leg. That is a real concern. The big mitten, Gary Payton, had another big game. Now, most of his production came in garbage time, which there was a lot of, but he played 31 minutes. It helped, of course, that Thomas was out, Beal was out, uh, so he got extra minutes there with those guys sidelined, and Jordan McRae was on a uh, minutes limit, but he played well again, 10-5-5. Five, and five. Now, the six steals weren't there, but still had one steal and two blocks. Not a 12-team league ad, I don't think, with Thomas coming back. Now, Ish Smith's been pretty poor in these games without Thomas, but I don't think Peyton's coming in and just taking a 25-minute-a-night role every night here as we move forward. Now, if Beal is out, that's a different story, and then we could get some value. So if you've got a stream spot, maybe you want to take a look at Peyton, but I wouldn't be getting overly excited with him. This is yeah, these, these numbers are not anywhere near really in line with what he's done in his career. Another weird product. And look, if you look at this and go, that's great. Look, Peyton, two games in a row. Jonathan Williams played 33 minutes in this game. And how many of you listen to this know who Jonathan Williams is know, or know that he was actually playing on the on the Wizards? Yeah, yeah he just he just is not this guy. Now, he played for the Lakers uh, last season, I believe. Nine and eight with a block for Williams in this one. Uh, it does appear that uh, Rui Hachimura could be back next game. He's already missed the five games that we thought he was going to be out. Tom Bryant uh, looks like he had a practice in the G League. He could be returning soon as well. Bertans has got a couple of games left. Wagner's got a couple of games left. All these guys could just come back all at once and really limit the value of these fringe-type guys like Anzesh Pesechniks, who played 24 minutes and had 17 and six with two steals. He can be a field goal percentage boost guy a scoring and rebounding type of player. But again, this is only for deep leagues. Interesting to note with Jordy McRae, 15 points in 15 minutes. He was on a minutes limit. Again, while if Bill misses time, McRae could be a streamer. But I think he fits in the rotation regardless, ahead of someone like a Gaz Payton. Beal had 15 points in his limited minutes. Ishmith was trash, 9 points in 23 there. The, uh, the the able seaman, Admiral Schofield, had no points in his 19 minutes as a start. Missed all six shots, not an NBA rotation caliber player at this point. While Troy Brown, solid enough, 13 and 6. Now, out of all these performances, Pashesniks and Williams and Payton, yeah, I think Brown is the one most likely to be able to sustain. So if you want to take a flyer on someone in a 12er, he is probably that guy you look at. For the Pistons, they made a change to their starting lineup. Tim Frazier started over uh, the Shark, Bruce Brown. Baby shark, do, 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 do. And then Dwayne Casey cleared everything up by saying that the starting point guard job's going to be fluid. Cool. That helps everybody. I don't know why Tim Frazier keeps getting these roles. Now, he played well here, Frazier. 17 and uh, 6 assists with 5 triples in 27 minutes. He can dish out the assists, but then there are games where he has 2 points and 3 assists. He's so wildly up and down that he is not a 12-team league. Add the Shark himself, 12 and 5, 5 assists, 2 steals, a block, 2 triples. He's been putting up you know, relatively solid lines for most of this time. We still don't know what happens when Reggie Jackson returns. This was a blowout again, and Derek Rose's minutes were kept low. He played just 21. Now, 15 points with six assists there for Rose. So Brown is the guy there out of him and Frazier that I'd want, but it's probably more for 14-teamers. The crucifix, Christian Wood, we know when he plays minutes, the numbers will be there. 22 points, seven rebounds, two triples. The plus-minus stuff has always been good. His net rating is, is excellent, but it's hard to read. When Marcus Morris, sorry, Markeith Morris plays only nine minutes, Griffin plays only 26, Drummond plays only 25. That is how much of an ass-kicking it was, and Wood is not going to play this much each game. If something changes and he gets these minutes, then sure, he is a guy that's going to put up those numbers. But there's a lot of steps that need to happen before he becomes a, a fantasy option, so therefore speculative stashing him. You require so many dominoes to fall in your direction. 
Drummond had 14 and 10. Griffin couldn't hit threes again, but 14, 11, and 4 is solid enough in that sort of a role. While Sviatoslav Mikhailuk, 25 minutes starting in place of the Duck, Luke Kennard, who's out for a couple of weeks. Mikhailuk hit four triples. He had four assists. He had a steal. He's not a 12 ad. He's more of a 16 team must add sort of a guy. He's a 14 team maybe add guy. He's available in tons of leagues, but there's some short term value here for Svi, who can go out and knock down threes, but the rest of his game is a little bit lacking. So I'm not saying he's a direct replacement for Kennard. He's more of that 16, maybe 14 team league player. The next game we look at was a surprise to be sure. A surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. Maybe only a welcome one if you're a Knicks fan. After losing to that horrible wizard squad, the Knicks on the road in Brooklyn get the victory 94-82. Brooklyn was absolutely atrocious in this game, but let's not take too much away from the Knicks, although they still only managed to score 94 points. Julius Randle so much better under Mike Miller. It's almost like the other coach was terrible. Maybe. 33 and 8 for Randall, a career high, five triples. Still, he had no defensive numbers, and I think he has four blocks on the entire season. He won't be getting any of those, but he's playing at a higher rate now, which is great. Marcus Morris returned. He'd been playing like 28 minutes a night. Came back from the Achilles injury, played 34, had 22 and 8, back to the same old nonsense from Morris. Again, I don't think he's a fantasy playoff type of a guy, but we'll see what they do. With him just jacking shots and, and Randall taking so many shots, it does take away from our boy Mitchie Robinson. Mitch Robinson says, I'll take it from here. But Robbo did play 28 minutes. He had a double-double. He had two blocks, and he stayed relatively out of foul trouble. Just two fouls for Robinson after he'd accumulated 17 fouls in the previous three games. Of course, he's a must-roster guy, as is Alfred Payton. 32 minutes for Alf. Uh, Dennis Smith injured, not playing. Frank Nilekina relegated to a horribly insignificant role. 13-7-4 for Payton. RJ Barrett was pretty bad here. Five points on 10 shots, seven rebounds, and two assists, and only 24 minutes. Well, Alonzo Trier, and I criticized um, Fisdale quite a bit, so I've got to um, have to criticize Miller. The up and downs in the role. Like Trier playing 20, 20, 20 minutes a game and then completely out of the rotation in this one. And I don't really understand why. I guess it's because Marcus Morris returned, but still, it, it was a weird one. Uh, Kevin Knox, only the 14 minutes. He is He's just not good. And my faith in him ever becoming good is zero. For the Nets, just an absolute disaster of a game. They shot 27% from the field. They including 29% from two-point range. Uh, Dinwiddie had 25 and 8 on some poor shooting, but he got to the line 17 times. The problem is there, he only hit 12 of them, so a net negative overall on your free throw percentage. Jarrett Allen was poor. Every, honestly, everybody was just bad. Torian Prince, what do we do with this bloke? He's not that good. Three points in 28 minutes. The shooting is real rough. If you want to drop him, by all means. He's not a must-roster guy. He still can have value. He'll have streaks where he plays well. But in general, he doesn't play well, and he's not He's not good. He's just not that good. Uh, Rowdy Rodion's Kuroks, eight points in 19 minutes. He's back into a rotation role at the moment, but will he last in that when Karis Levert returns, which could be soon? And same goes for Timotei Lawawu Cabro. 10 points for Lawawu Cabro. Two steals, one block, two triples. Nice uh, uh, across-the-board production, but hard to see him as a two-way guy being a must-roster guy. DeAndre Jordan still rostered in way too many leagues. He's rostered in 74% of leagues. Smoke and Joe Harris in 70. I would not have uh, that, uh, that set up going. While Garrett Temple had seven points and nine rebounds in his 30 minutes. And his value is going to disappear pretty quickly once Levert eventually gets back in action, which looks like it might be just a couple of games away. We don't know that for sure yet because the Nets, of course, are horribly, horribly inefficient in terms of telling us when players are returning. The Memphis Grizzlies with a massive win on the road over the Oklahoma City Thunder, 110-97. And your mate, my mate, Jaron Jackson Jr., Triple J, 20 points, four rebounds. That's disappointing, but four assists, two steals, three blocks, two triples. He has exceeded my expectations offensively. He can still bring more defensively. He is going to be, I think, a top 20 fantasy player at some point in the next three years, and he looked pretty good here. While the wave pulled DeAnthony Melton, only 20 minutes, but this guy just can't stop racking up numbers. 9, 8, and 4 with two steals. He should be playing minutes over Dylan Brooks. He should be playing minutes minutes over Grayson Allen and Tyus Jones. Give him 25 a night, and he's a 12-team guy. Uh, He's not there yet. He's an interesting 14-team league player, but yeah, him and Brandon Clark off the bench. They need more minutes. Now, Clarkie had 13 and 4 with two triples, a steal, and a block. I don't know why they're limiting his minutes unless his oblique issue is causing a problem. And if that's the case, that makes more sense. 
He shouldn't be playing only 19 minutes. I don't need... no. Actually, let's try it again. Nobody needs to see 14 minutes of Solomon Hill. Literally nobody needs to see that. Clark should be getting all of those minutes. He is still a 12-team league hold despite this confusion in how his role is being handled. Tyus Jones had 15 points in his 22 minutes, one of his better games, but 6 of 7 shooting is not realistic, while Valanciunas had 21 points on 82% shooting. This team shot 55% from the field in this game. Morant, a weirdly low usage game. 10 points on only 9 shots, 5 rebounds, and 3 assists. Of course, he'll be better. While Dylan Brooks, man, how rough is this bloke? He is so up and down. He is so inconsistent about yeah, trying to work out what his role is going to be. He just had 8 points in those 25 minutes with no other numbers. His steals have been pretty good this year. He's more of a 12-team streamer, a 14-team league guy, but I just don't see him as a long-term good player in the NBA. For the Thunder, Gildas Alexander, his run continued. 21 points, only the one assist, but did have the three steals, while Chris Paul was amazing. 23, 6, and 11, and three steals. He has been absolutely rolling since that slow start to the season. Adams had 16, 6, and 4, and he is also playing much better than the beginning of the year. Noel only had two points, but... Two steals, three blocks. That's why you have him. That's why you value him. And he brings it most nights. Well, Dennis Schroeder, I've just been talking about how ridiculous his shooting had been in my article I wrote for Yahoo. And then he went out and shot 38%. His numbers, his usage and true shooting percentage combination over the last two weeks prior to today was a historic thing that only four players had ever done in the history of the NBA over the course of a season. It was Steph, Harden, Yanni, and one other player that I wish I could remember. Go and read the article and you'll find out. Darius Basley started for the Italian cock, Danilo Gallinari. Hands off my cock! Who's going to be out at least the next two games. Basley had been putting up some pretty good defensive numbers. Didn't here. Three points in 19 minutes because we had to get nine minutes of Deontay Burton and 11 minutes of Mike Muscala. I don't know what the point is of Muscala playing those minutes. He remains really, really bad. Now, Basley wasn't great, but yeah, I would much rather give those minutes to someone like uh, Basley versus someone like Muscala who continues to be trash. Basley is more of that 16-team league type of ad, at least for this short-term type period. The next game that we go into here, the San Antonio Spurs and the Dallas Mavericks. This margin was a lot bigger than this. Uh, it looks it's a four-point game. It really wasn't that close. Uh, Dallas was up by about 20 points at some point in the last quarter, and then San Antonio really got a run on. So 102-98, the Mavericks win. Rudy Gay, 18-8, two steals, two blocks, four triples. It's an amazingly good line. There's just no way to trust that from him. Uh, Aldridge had 17 and 7 with two blocks. Solid enough. Walter DeRozan, 21, 5 and 4. This team continues to be poorly coached and poorly put together, I believe. And I know Greg Popovich is the greatest coach of all time. It doesn't mean he's immune to criticism because he should be criticized for a lot of the poor decisions he's made, like not playing Lonnie Walker the drip at all. 15 minutes for Marco Bellinelli. 25 minutes for God knows what reason of Bryn Forbes. The consistent back and forth of Maximum Derek and DeJounte uh, Murray. Four points for Murray here with three steals. White had 10, 4, and 6, which is great. But again, these minutes are so low. White's a 14-teamer. Murray's a 12. Give them both 28 minutes, and they're both clear top 100 guys. It's just the refusal to do that is confusing. DeRozan continues to be a guy who puts up stats and be a negative basketball player. And I... I reckon in two years' time, DeRozan is not going to be an NBA starter. I feel pretty good about saying that. I don't feel good because I don't want him to you know, have his career diminished, but I feel confident in saying that. That's maybe more what I meant. Yucca Pertl, two blocks in 17 minutes, but 17 minutes isn't going to cut it. If he gets a 25-minute roll, then uh, look, this team should blow it up. Aldridge and DeRozan should be gone. Give 30 minutes to uh, to Pertl, get Walker in there, get Murray, get White, get it all happening. But of course, that's never going to happen despite the obvious signs that it needs to with this squad. For the Mavericks, Luka Doncic was back 24-10-8. Didn't shoot all that well. Not quite himself, but still really good stuff. Well, DeLon Wright, 21 minutes, and that's the annoying thing, 21 minutes, but 12-5-4, three steals, two triples. We thought he'd be able to do this, get those 30 minutes a night, 29 minutes a night, playing alongside Luka, but we're, whatever reason, experimenting with Tim Hardaway there. Wright is a good 14-team league ad. If it ever pushes to 25, he is a 12-teamer, but it just doesn't appear they're going that way. Finney Smith continues to play well, 13-6, 83% shooting is not realistic. He's a nice deeper league sort of an ad. Dwight Powell had 11-7, while Kristaps Porzingis. Porzingis. Now, we all talked about how the drop-off was going to come when Doncic returned, and it hit, it hit us pretty hard. 27% from the field, 50% from the line has nothing to do with Luka returning. The 23% usage does, and that's the concern there. That, that usage was, It was as clear as dog's balls, but... If you were able to execute that sell high where he was the 20th ranked player over the last two weeks, then congratulations to you. 
that has dropped off. Of course, Jalen the Burner Brunson is a pretty obvious drop. He played only 14 minutes. Seth Curry just the 16 minutes and went scoreless. Well, Timmy Hardaway had 17 points in 28 minutes. Hardaway is not a must roster player. He can help in points. He can hit some threes. He's inconsistent. He's wild with his field goal percentage, but that does not make him, I don't think, a must roster player. Now on to the late games where there was just true like insanity going on in these games. The first one, one of the worst double overtime games you'll ever see as the Minnesota Timberwolves somehow get a victory over the Sacramento Kings 105-104. And yes, I know one team's got to win, but if there was ever a time when no team was going to win, it was going to be this game. Um, no Carl Anthony Towns. Gorgie Jeng started, played 41 minutes, had 21 and 15, three threes, two steals and a block. And this guy is still a good productive fantasy player. When Towns is out, he puts up value. When Towns is back, he plays 12 minutes and it's useless. So while Towns is out, and it looks like his return could be coming soon, uh, maybe a couple of games more would be my guess here for Towns. Uh, Jeng is, is worth a stream. The Timberwolves initially released a lineup saying Shabazz Napier was the starters. Uh, the starter, then they put out a lineup saying Jarrett Culver was the starter, and they went back saying Shabazz Napier was a starter. I was surprised they'd put Culver back in as the starter considering how bad he has been, but Napier did in fact start. Only played 22 minutes. Two points, but nine assists and two steals. That's enough to sort of look at as more of a 14-team league guy. They also benched Josh Okogie, who has been playing poorly, seven and eight, seven and five in 18 minutes, while Culver, again, was trashed, two, five and two. He did have two steals and a block, so that's marginally encouraging, but he's nowhere near a 12-teamer. Bob Covington, a pretty decent bounce back, 19 and eight. He had two blocks late in the game as well, hit two threes. Much better to see those 40 minutes from Covington. But again, it also puts into perspective the fact that those 28, 27-minute nights that he plays is nothing to do with injury. It's due to poor coaching from Ryan Saunders. Covington's a hold. Wiggins was horrible in terms of shooting. 21% on 19 attempts. 18, 10, and 7. But 8 of 10 from the line is really strong. While Teague had 15 and 6. My name is Jeff. But like literally everybody in this game, he shot poorly, just 29%. This team shot 35%. The other team... Also shot 35%. That other team was the Sacramento Kings. Rashawn Holmes was dominant. 45 minutes, 20 and 18. Two steals, two blocks, 60% shooting. He is, of course, the best big man on this team. Maybe he's the best player. Well, at the moment, he's the best player because the other candidate to be the best player got injured again. De'Aaron Fox played two minutes in this game before going out with what they called back spasms. It appeared more to be a hip-type issue. So we'll see what this means. The Kings do have an upcoming back-to-back, -back, so Fox could miss a game there. And then if you're looking to stream in assists, Maybe it's Corey Joseph, but we know Joseph wasn't a must-roster 12-team guy beforehand. Uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic had a sore ankle, somehow played 43 minutes, 19 and 7, three blocks, three threes, horrible shooting, 29% from Bogdan, but at least we got those minutes. And Luke Walton's consistent reliance on Trevor Ariza remains confusing. 34 minutes for Ariza. He was 0 of 3 from the field, didn't score a point, but did have 11 rebounds. I just don't understand why he's playing as much as he is. Now, yes, of course, there were injuries here, but the fact that he was playing minutes over Buddy Heald was ridiculous. Heald played 37 minutes in the end, but was benched and didn't uh, dispense down the stretch of the fourth quarter and didn't play the beginning of the first overtime. He ended with 17 points on 30% shooting. But if you're going to bench someone because they're not hitting shots, bench this entire game. It, it, Walton's not a good coach. I think, we're, I think we're all well aware of that. He is a bad coach, and that is impacting a lot of these guys. The other injury here, Marvin Bagley. He had 18 and 4 in 20 minutes before leaving the game with a foot injury. We don't know the specifics of this foot injury at this point. It is really troublesome. Again, this, he is a, he can be a high usage scorer. That's fine. We know he struggles in all those other areas, which I always think is going to limit his fantasy potential. If you are looking for a stream to add, Nemanja Bjelica will usually be that guy, although they did prefer Ariza for God knows what reason. In this game, he got the 34 minutes and Bjelica got 16. But I think if Bagley is out, we'll see Bjelica starting again, and he can put up those 12 team numbers that he did before that, uh, before that combination of Holmes and Bagley worked together. Let's move on to the last game, which again was a, a wild one. Um, the Portland Trailblazers lose to the Jazz, 121-115. The Jazz were up 20 points at the start of the fourth quarter. The Blazers got it back close until the Jazz uh, pulled away at the end thanks to some Carmelo Anthony misfires and miscues. Lillard was great, 34 points with eight assists in 37 minutes, while CJ had 25 points. It was a poor shooting night until they got hot down the stretch, had three threes with two assists and a steal, 44% overall. Anthony Simons, probably his best game. He looks good when he plays well. 15 points, 7 of 9 shooting, and everyone gets so excited. The 10 rebounds are nice, but no assists, no steals, no blocks, and it took 7 of 9 shooting to put up a line like this and to get these minutes. This is why he's not a great fantasy prospect. He's going to need big minutes and big usage to actually be useful unless something changes in his career, which it could. I think it's apt to play this one. The 
Whiteside. He's been playing well, Hassan Whiteside, but he was destroyed by Gobert here. 22 minutes, 8 points, 6 rebounds, 1 block. The 22 minutes is the real factor. He'd been playing like 32, 33 and absolutely dominating. Uh, this was not dominating. Well, Carmelo Anthony, he's ranking. Again, if you're really swayed by rankings, not wanking, you can do whatever you want with that. If you're really swayed by ranking, Mallow's numbers have been elevated by really high steal rates, really high block rates, and really high three-point percentage. It didn't necessarily happen that way here. 12 and 7, 39% shooting overall, one steal, no blocks, no assists, uh, a poor a shot at the end of an ISO 3, a foul call against him at the end. He did really, yeah, and some of the concerns you have with Mallow, hey, will he give it to the better players in the clutch moments? Well, it didn't end up here. He is still a guy that we roster, but there was so much about what he was doing, which was at an unsustainable level, those three things, and if they fall off, he goes back to being that back-end guy instead of a top 60, top 70 player, which he was over the last two weeks. Baseball was useless, useless in this one with Simons again outperforming him. For the Jazz, Jinglin Joe Ingles, he is on an absolute roll. 26, 5, and 4, 6 triples. He's turning into a bit of a sell high guy because he's doing it on unbelievably high shooting numbers. 87% true shooting in this one. Big minutes as well for Ingles. And while Conley is out, he's putting up these numbers. He, he I think he still will start when Mick returns, but. Yeah, will this level of playing time and usage and shooting all stick? There are three things there that will probably drop off for Ingles. Mitchell had 35 and seven assists. He's done. He's good. Gobert, 16 and 15, while Boyan Bogdanovich, 16 points. It took 15 shots to get there. We know about his wild swings in terms of the shooting numbers. Uh, Jordy Clarkson's debut for Utah. Tw- Utah, 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 that's it. Utah, 21 minutes, nine points, no rebounds, no assists, one steal, Four of 12 shooting. Yeah, you can drop his ass in 10s, in 12s, maybe in 14 team leagues. Him and Moutier was a pretty poor combination, and they uh, let the Blazers back into it. Clarkson probably will get better with Utah, but he's not going to sniff 12 team league value. I feel pretty confident about saying that. O'Neal had seven rebounds, four assists, and eight points. That's solid enough. He's sort of a 14 team league guy. At this point, newly signed Rajon Tucker did not play while we also got some random three minutes of Tony Bradley action. Let's look at the injury report or injury update here. Luke Kennard's going to be out for at least a couple of weeks with his knee injury. He's a 10 and 12 team drop, probably even a 14 team leaguer, depending on who you're adding. While Kevon Looney's going to miss a couple with an abdominal injury. Oh, this is almost just a write-off season for Looney. Hip issues, uh, sorry, hamstring issues now, an abdominal issue. Kerr's not playing him. It's just a write-off. Paul Washington Jr. returning really quickly after his broken finger. Now, initially, Woj said broken finger five games. He's actually missed five games, so Woj was on the money. But then a couple of days after that, the Hornets came out and said, no, he's actually had surgery on his finger. When I consulted with Jeff Stotts about that, he said, look, the average games missed for a for finger surgery for a broken finger is about five to six weeks worth, like 18 games. But the fact that he's back in five is remarkable after surgery. You can go and add him, although some of his production has been quite up and down. LeBron is dealing with a groin issue. LeBron James. He got kneed by Patrick Beverly in that area and said it hampered him. Of course, the groin problem cost him plenty of time last year. He was having a thoracic injury before this game. You do worry about LeBron at his age and the injuries, anything that happens, there is real concern about that. Of course, we just hold tighter at this point. And then the Italian cock, the rooster, Danilo Gallinari. Hands off my cock! He's going to miss at least the next two games with an ankle injury that puts Darius Basley into that starting lineup, not a 12-team league ad. Then Bradley Beal missed or had to leave today's game with leg soreness. We will update that as we hear more about it. Hopefully, it's nothing to do with the stress reactions he had a couple of years ago. And then De'Aaron Fox left today's game with his back and Marvin Bagley with a foot injury to just wrap up an absolutely shitful time for the Sacramento Kings, losing to the previously winless in December Minnesota Timberwolves in double overtime. Let's move on to DFS. We're looking at fan jewel pricing for Friday's games. There are seven of them for us to talk about. No, there's not. There's actually six. Let's start talking about them. All right, let's go into the first game here. It is the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Boston Celtics. The Celtics are favored by 13 points. Marcus Smart is questionable, while Larry Nance Jr. is questionable. It looks like Dante Exum will be ready to play as well after being traded from Utah. The total here is 216, but there is a real blowout possibility in this game. Now, Kemba Walker's been struggling a little bit. The salary has dropped down to 7,300 because he's averaging just 25 points over the last three games, and that blowout risk is real, but there is no better situation for opposing points guards to go into than taking on the Cavs. So that does give him some value at that price. He just needs 35 points to really bring back some value for you. 
the Padawan Colin Sexton at 55, really strong cash floor, limited upside, while Garland at 42 is the opposite, no floor whatsoever. But at that salary, he could have a 35-pointer, which would work out. Just that defensive matchup is pretty rough. At shooting guard, Smart's at 52. No better team to get back on track against, but can he see? That's the big question, I guess. More of a, a GPP type of a guy if we do hear that he's playing. At small forward, Kevin Porter Jr.'s at 4,100. I like that price. He had 28 points in the game uh, where Clarkson was traded just before it. The matchup's not a good one for him, though, but I think opportunities should be coming his way, and he can fill it up, and 25 points is far from out of the question. Jalen's at 7,200. He is absolutely rolling at the moment, averaging over 40 points in the last three games. The matchup is great for him. I just worry that the blowout might take him out of consideration. Same with Gordo Haywood at 6,600. Uh, other small forwards we look at includes Chetty Osman, and then we just look away into a different direction. Although, to be fair, Chetty is averaging 24 over the last three. I just think the matchup's a rough one. At power forward, Kevin Love is at 7,100. Love is actually averaging over 40 in his last three games. The minutes have been up, but this matchup's tough. The blowout risk is real, and any sign of a blowout, Love's minutes come down, so I'm not interested. Tatum's too high at 7,800. Vanilla Tice at 44 also too highly priced. Larry Nance, Johnny Henson, Grant Williams, no to all of those guys. At center, Tristan Thompson, 6,300. Absolutely zero upside, I believe, with Thompson. Maybe there's an okay floor, but that just feels a little bit too high. While Ennis Cantor at 49 has been playing pretty well. Um, he's giving us 30 a game over the last five. And at 4,900, you won't complain about that. Rob Williams is still out. Vincent Poirier is still out. Grant Williams gets some center minutes. But I just think the, the floor of Cantor is not high enough. The ceiling is also not high enough. Even though he could very easily get you 25, I just think there's too much uncertainty and not enough upside uh, ability there for Ennis Cantor in that matchup. Next game, we look at the Oklahoma City Thunder. They are on a back-to-back, -back, taking on a, the Charlotte Hornets. In Charlotte, the total is 210.5, so a pretty low total. The Thunder are favored by 4.5 here. P.J. Washington making an early return from injury. He is uh, probable to play in this one, so that's going to have an impact on guys like Batum and Cody Martin and Marvin Williams and Bismack Biombo and Cody Zeller. All those players will be affected. Chris Paul's at 7,300. I like the matchup for Paulie. He's putting up good numbers. He hasn't set out back-to-backs this season. Big on him in this one. The Thunder need this win. While Terry Rozier is down at 6,800. Now, the matchup against point guards for the Thunder is a tough one. At 6,800, I do like him as more of a tournament guy than anything. For your shooting guards, Devontae Graham at 7,400. If one of these days the shot goes in, he's going to smash that number. Absolutely kill it. I like him a lot. Gildas Alexander at 7,000. Also, in the midst of a pretty strong run, and the defensive aptitude of the Hornets doesn't particularly scare me. Well, Dennis Schroeder's at 64. Still struggled, well, not still, did struggle with his shooting on Thursday. Still put up numbers. I think at that price, he is absolutely an option. Malik Monk is not, nor is Terry Ferguson or Deontay Burton. Remember, the Italian cock Danilo Gallinari is out for this one. So in his place, Darius Basley will start. He can get you 20 points, but is there upside there in him? They limited his minutes so that Burton could play and Mascala could play, which seems uh, antithetical to uh, good basketball. But that's where we're at with Basley. Maybe a tournament guy, but not too much. Miles Bridges, really good game last time from him, 33 points. But with Washington come back, coming back, it does cramp him a little bit, so I'm not that keen there. Batum and Nadia, probably not. At power forward, Noel, no thank you. Uh, Paul Washington's at 5,200. He'd been putting up pretty good numbers. Uh, before that, at 5,200, I do think that he is worth absolutely a GPP look. Marvin Williams, no thank you. And with Zeller and Biombo at center, 52 for Zeller, 48 for Biombo. They were getting some power forward minutes as well. Uh, that's not even to include the minutes that Washington will get at center. It impacts both of those guys, so they're not options. Steve Adams at 64. Uh, recent numbers are pretty good. The matchup here is a really good one. So this is the spot where I do like Adams. Going up against Charlotte is a strong, strong matchup for big men. Next up, the Philadelphia 76ers and the Oklahoma, try again, the Orlando Magic, the Sixers at the Magic. The Sixers are three-point favorites, and the total is 209.5, the lowest total of the day for the ones that have been released, all spreads released apart from one of the games. At point guard, DJ Augustin's at $4,000. He'd been rolling until last game where he wasn't rolling. This matchup's horrible. I'm not interested in Deej here, while Markel Fultz at 5,200, probably find better point guards out on the market. 8,700 for Ben Simmons. Now, Simo is killing it. 52-point average over the last three. The Magic is a, ma a marginally negative matchup. I'm not sure that we look at Simmons at that big price rise as an optimal play here. For your shooting guards, Fournier's at 55. He is really struggling, so I'll fade that. Joshie Richardson at 6,000. 
possibly a little bit too high for a low totaled game such as this one. Terry Ross and Furkan Korkmaz. Korkmaz is playing well at the moment at 3,800. There's some GPP value in him. Same as Terry Ross, who dropped a big one last game, but we cannot rely upon him on an ongoing basis. Via small forward, Johnny Isaacs at 62. Last time we saw the Magic in action, he dropped in 51 fantasy points. That's great. 6,200, I'm not really interested in that. Toby Harris is at 71, and he's got low, uh, low ceiling, but also a pretty stable floor. So he's not a bad cash guy to have a look at. Uh, for your power forwards, Al Horford's at 6,400. I just think we can do better than that. Aaron Gordon is not one option to do better than that, although he is averaging 35 in his last three, which at 62 is worth looking at. I just hate this matchup for him while at center. Nikola Vucevic is at 7,900. Um, Embiid's a tough one to go up against, but I think that that price does give value to Vooch at that salary, while Embiid is putting up good numbers. Under 10,000 for Embiid, you always got to look at him. He's averaging 52 over his last five. He is a strong, strong play going up against this Orlando squad. Next game that we take a look at here is the Milwaukee Bucks and the Atlanta Hawks. The Budenholzer Bowl is back in action. The Bucks are 11-point favorites. The total is a big, big 237.5. So the blowout risk is clearly in play here for these Bucks guys. Uh, Jabari Parker has turned up on the injury report as probable. Alex Len is doubtful with an ankle sprain. Giannis is probable with a uh, back injury. And Evan Turner also probable with a hammy problem. At point guard, Trey Young's at 10,400. This guy just gets 50s pretty much every night. Really, really like Trey at that spot. Georgie Hill's at 42. Love what he's doing. He's just not a big DFS scorer, so that's a no from me. Kevin Herter, fan of pants at 53. Really putting up good numbers. 29 average over the last three. 5,300. He should exceed that number. Had 32 the last time out. They won't limit his minutes. While well, the big ragu, Dante DiVincenzo's at 49. I like what he does. It just doesn't translate that well for DFS. Chris Middleton also in the midst of a good run, but he's a $1,200 price riser up to 74. Blowout risk makes me want to di disappear from him. Sterling Brown, Paddy Connaughton, Sterling... Uh, uh, I said Sterling Brown. Right? Where's Matthews? That's the guy I'm looking for. Benbury, Korba, no thanks. Small forward, Yanni is at 11,600. If we knew this game would be close, he would smash that, but there is risk involved. I still think it's low enough to consider using uh, under the Kumpo. DeAndre Hunter at 48. I don't really like DeAndre Hunter's game all that much. But I do like him at that salary. I think there is value in that. Cam Reddish, no, 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 no. And then at Power Forward, the Baptist, John Collins, 8,100. He dropped 51 in his return from suspension. I don't need 51 from him at 8,100 to get value. So I think there is a good, good play for him here in this one. While Bruno Fernando should be the starting center again. Alex Lenz out. He's a minimum salary player. Now he has really done very little so far this season. Maybe a tournament option there. While Jabari's role has disappeared. Five points in 15 minutes last game. He is down all the way at 3,900. That at least makes him a sneaky tournament guy, especially if they want to go smaller. But I just don't think that's going to be too much of a play. At center, Brook Lopez at 4,900. I love Lopez at that salary. He should get 26, 27, um, uh, 26 or 27 points there in that one. All right, let's move on to the next game. We have got the Indiana Pacers and the Miami Heat. Justice Winslow, uh, his injury has been changed to a bone back bruise, uh, back bone bruise. That's better. Uh, so that's not, obviously not good. While Malcolm Brogdon is questionable for uh, for Indiana, also um, uh, Victor Oladipo is out, of course. That point guard, the iron shoulder, Goran Dragic at 51. Love what he's been doing. Yeah, limited minutes, but still putting up those numbers. I think he's a strong option here. While Kendrick Nunn at 45, the numbers have been tumbling down for Nunn. I think at 45, there's some GPP value with Winslow out, but Dragic's return has actually really hurt him quite a bit. While Brogo's at 66, if Brogdon plays, there's not that's not bad. I think we still probably leave it out, but if he is out, Aaron Holiday at 47 becomes a really, really good option. At shooting guard, Tyler Hero's at 42. Yeah, tournament value only for him. Well, Jim Butler's at 85. Butler's numbers recently haven't been that good, just 38 points a game over the last five, and we need 45 for him to get to this, so I think we'll probably fade that. Dunk Robinson, always just a GPP guy, so dependent on the shooting. If Brogdon is out, the 4,800 for Jeremy Lamb, I think, is worth looking at. He had 29 points in 35 minutes last game with Brogo's sideline. So I think Jezza at 48 would be good, only in the Brogdon absence, while Derek Jones Jr. is at 41. He is a tournament type of guy who can rack up multiple steals and blocks. And with Winslow out, his minutes are up, but he's hard to trust ongoing. While Tony Warren Jr. at 53, really like that price even more so if Brogdon is out. At power forward, Sabonis is at 83. Probably a little bit too high for DeMontis. He's more of a 79 guy to me. Not bad value, especially for uh, for cash games. While Bam Adebayo is all the way up at 9,000 because he's killing it. He's averaging 50 points a game over the last five games. 
no reason to steer clear too much away from him. While Miles Turner's playing better as well. He's at 5,900. I think there could be a bit of a bubble burst coming for Turner here. I'd only want to use him in tournaments. Myers Leonard and Kelly Olenek, I'm not really interested in using them in any sort of situation. The next game and the last game that we look at is the Phoenix Suns and the Golden State Warriors. DeAndre Ayton is out. Kelly Oubre is probable, while the triangle Eric Pascal is questionable with that hip contusion. And it does sound like he's going to miss some time or at least miss this game just for the way that the Steve Kerr was talking the other day. At point guard, ravishing Rick Rubio is at 7,200, really putting up you know, strong numbers. Is that too high? I think it's bordering on it, but this matchup's is uh, quite a good one for point guard. So Rubio is in play there. Uh, the lubricant, Kai Bowman, he is back in the G League. We don't know if he'll be back and ready to play in this one, while the backup point guards for uh, the Suns are always uh, up in the air. Devin Booker is all the way down to 6,900. Giggity! Um, I think at that price, you have to use him. I think that, especially in tournaments, but you have to look at that, considering how poorly he's been playing, that that price coming down, there is a big upside value. Well, Damian Lee, they've skyrocketed him all the way up to 5,800 based on his 53-point Christmas Day performance. Now, expecting that level of performance from Lee is tough. I think he's more of a tournament guy. And even with that performance, his last five games, averaging 31 minutes, he's still averaging only 31 points. So more of a point-per-game fantasy producer, including that big one against Houston. So he could be one of those ones that you maybe steer clear of as other people get sucked in. D'Angelo's at 82, hasn't really given us that number, but this matchup works for him. I think there is some GPP value there in D'Angelo Russell. At small forward, Cam Johnson, no thank you. Uh, Ubre's at 61. Hasn't really been where we need him to be, but I think this could be a great opportunity for, I know it's a great opportunity actually. While Alec Burks weirdly only played 24 minutes, if Bowman is down in the G League and doesn't come back up, then Burks' minutes will jump and he becomes a relatively good option in this one. Glennie Robinson, the little dog, I don't really feel that excited about him. For your power forwards, Draymond's at 65. He dropped 38 on Christmas Day against Houston. I'm just not really sure of his total upside here or DFS usability. I think we can do better. Sharich at 4,200. The minutes for him have been really down. The salary has come down. But even in the low minutes, he's still averaging 24 a game in 23 minutes, which at 4,200 is not bad. With eight and out, I think he's a sneaky GPP guy that many people will steer clear of. Frank the Tank's at 37, also just a GPP guy. Eric Pascal's at 37, and even if he plays, I think his minutes will be low. And then Marquise Chris, no thank you. Also, Whisper, that, or not Whisper, Steve Cursetta, he reckons he's going to get Alan Smilogic into the rotation. It will just be limited minutes, and he probably just takes Omari Spellman's playing time. Baines is at 41. Absolutely love that as a starter. Now, he has really struggled the last few games. Only 19 points in 29 minutes, but 4,100, I think you have to use him. Well, Corley Stein has been crushing it, but his salary is all the way up at 6,100 now. Unless you believe he's going to maintain two and a half steals and two blocks a game, then then he gets that value. I'm, I'm just not so certain he's going to be able to do that because realistically, who does? Um, yeah, so he is a tough one at that elevated salary. We go over to DraftKings for some options there. Now, Willie's at 45 over there. That's fantastic. I like Baines. I like D'Angelo, Johnny Collins, Devin Booker, Middleton and Yanni with that uh, blowout risk. The minimum salary, Bruno Fernando, could be an option there. Hunter and Herter uh, for Atlanta too. Devontae Graham, Jimmy Butler, Toby Harris, Sabonis, uh, Terry Rogier also come in as some pretty solid DraftKings options. That'll do me for today and for the week of Christmas. I'll be back next week to uh, preview the season not the season, to preview the week and then get everything started with our waiver wire shows and our daily recaps and all that stuff will be happening. If you don't want to miss an episode, subscribe. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and on YouTube. Give me a thumbs up there as well and leave a comment, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Malcolm Miller.